Thank you, Suzanne. Good morning, Gael. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, Hi. good. So we'll start this wonderful uh, webinar today. Uh, we'll talk, be talking about the DNS. I'm pretty sure that you you want to know exactly what will be all about the DNS and what will be all about the resiliency of the DNS. So before we start, uh, we have a question for you. What is your the level of knowledge on DNS? So we kindly invite you, invite you to go to menti, www.menti.com. You type in the code 838101, and then you have the answer. So if you can go to menti, menti.com, and you just tell us what is your level of knowledge on the DNS. And please uh, keep a window on that page because we'll be using Menti a lot during this webinar. So you have three questions. Uh, what is your level of confidence on the theory around the DNS? And the second one on the implementation of authoritative DNS. And the third one, implementation of resolvers. So tell us, already four people, good. We are more than 200 today. So what is your level of knowledge on the DNS? Okay. 20 people so far. Okay, good. Can we have 50 more? You can use menti.com, please, uh, because we'll be using menti a lot. So please uh, open the window, go on menti.com and type the code you have in front of your screen, 838101. Okay, so based on the trend, we see that uh, you know you have a good theory uh, about the, around the DNS uh, regarding the implementation. Um, Less than less than seventy people know exactly, so no one is an expert so far. Okay. Four more before we move on. Okay, good. Okay, we we'll move ahead. So let's start with the agenda. So today we'll be talking about the three major components of the DNS, the mechanism of the resolution, and we'll go uh, into the operational consideration that you have to take into account, and we'll finish by understand the role of the Anycast in the DNS. So this is the kind of uh, typical network that you can have uh, for the DNS. Um, uh, that we'll use during this webinar. Consider that we can have what we call one forward zone, some several reverse zones, uh, two authoritative servers, and also one resolver and one host. So before we move on, what is the DNS itself? So the DNS is, you can have several definition, but you see I just, uh, Put at the top here one RFC, which is it's a new one. It has been written in January 2019, where you have a kind of um, summarization of everything around the DNS. But the DNS basically uh, can be three things: a naming chain for objects on the internet, a distributed database uh, representing the names and certain properties of this object, or the last one, which is simple query response protocol. So basically that is it. So most of you, I guess you know the DNS because it's kind, it can be like a phone book where you have, uh, you store a name and you have the IP. It can be the reverse as well, but not only. So let's talk about the three major components of the DNS. So for the three major components, you have the, first of all, the domain namespace and the resource records. You also have the name servers and the resolvers. 
So let's start by the first one, the three major component, the domain namespace itself. I guess you all, 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 all of you know this kind of tree when we talk about the DNS. So you have to know that the DNS start by the root. The root is something people sometimes can forget, but the root is this dot. So anytime you have a zone, you always start by the root. Then you have the top level domain, which can be just after the root, and the second level, which can be any name. So in that case, for instance, you have uh, the domain called sixlab.afni.net, which is basically um, six lab can be the third level domain, Afrinic the second level, and you have the first level domain name. So basically oh. that's it for the forward zone. I was, I was going to say really that what's interesting about um, this is that uh, whenever we type um, uh, um, a domain on a browser or we have an access to a, to, we want to access a, a URL, we don't use the dot at the end. And, and that's an interesting feature because it is implicit that there's only one route, right? So uh, while, you know, um, as you query um, different, um, for different objects or different resources, and you might go through different parts of the tree. So you might go through .net or .com, you need those, but, um, but the last dot is the kind of a unique and it's a single, and that's the root that is shared across uh, the internet. And that's, that's, a, that's an important uh, feature, right? Because um, that means that we're all using the same root. So yes, that was right. just a, a little uh, comment. Yes, you're right. Then you have the forward zone, which is the, let's say the more natural, we have the name. We want maybe the IP, IP for IPv6, but we also have, this is the kind of the content that you have in the forward zone file. Um, usually we have what we call the resource records. Okay. So in the chat, can some people tell me what resource record do you see in this file, for instance? In this, the file you just have uh, in the screen right now. How many kind of resource record can you see? Okay. So people just are starting to, to think of it. Yeah. Okay, so people are just typing, I see a lot. Okay, but some are, are not here. So the resource record that you can have here, are, you have in this file, we have the NS, okay, for name server, MX, for mail, you also have the quad A for IPv6. You have the A for IPv4. You have the C name TXT. And in this example, you can see that we also have uh, something which is not very common, but uh, the most important for you is to understand that in your zone file, you can have a lot of resource records. That's basically one feature of the DNS. So we are talking about the forward zone file, but which is the more common, but also you have to um, know that we also have what we call the reverse zone file, uh, where we can, we have a number, be it IPv4, IPv6, and from this IP, we want to know what is the name behind this number. This is the purpose of the reverse zone. So may, may Willie, before we go, and, and it might be just, uh, may I ask somebody in the chat if somebody is uh, surprised by uh, how straightforward and, and, and simple it can look uh, uh, a forward zone file? Um, is, is there somebody surprised? Because you can see, you know, sometimes we might believe that it's much more complicated to manage um, the domain names and the resources uh, but it's actually quite quite realistic. It's just a text file, right? So you can see very well and very uh, simple that you have name servers, um, uh, mail exchange um, addresses. 
There's a good question there. The Brie yeah. records. I Brie don't know yes. if I can help that. Yes, I can. Uh, okay, for Very Maurice. Good. Yes, Brie here is, okay. Remember that what you have at the left is a name, okay? And what you have at the right is the answer. So in that case, the name is Brie. Uh, let me write it. It will be Brie dot six lab dot afrinic dot net okay but the resource record here is s s h f p and we use you use this resource record when you want to uh, store the certificate of your open ssh server okay it's a way to store the certificate of your ssh server so anytime okay. you want to log in into your ssh server you can check, okay, is it the right certificate that my open SSH server is using now? So you can store all your certificate in your zone file. And this is only one feature that you can, of the yes. DNA. And, and um, we'll, 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 we'll answer very quickly the question, um, the next one, what the forward uh, zone file is really used for? Well, this is the location where you define the 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 resources um, um, of your of your zone. If you have different hosts and services, which you use names, this is where you define them. That that's 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 the, the sort of the database where things live, right? And maybe exactly. we shouldn't. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Also, by the way, if you people have a um, question, don't forget to use the question and answer section, please. Okay, so we move on with the next one. Um, now the reverse zone, uh, remember we have the IP, IPv4, IPv6, and we want to know what is the name behind this IP. So this is the purpose of the reverse zone. So again, we always start by the root, okay, the dot. And after the dot regarding the reverse zone, you have the upper. And after the upper, you have for IPv4, you have on your left, this one in ADDR and for IPv6 on your right, this domain, okay? And this is the DNS tree regarding the reversal. So just an example here in this file, this is, um, a content of an IPv4 reverse zone file, where you see the structure is basically the same. You always has always have the header, okay, and then you have some resource record set, the NS, exact exactly the same. And now you have in the reverse zone we have a specific record which is the resource record which is called the PTR. Okay, this is the most important resource record that you will find in the reverse zone. This reverse zone is for an IPv4 reverse zone file. Same principle apply also for the reverse zone for IPv6. Always the name, the header, the SOA, you have the name servers and you have the PTR resource record. Regarding IPv6, don't worry about the length of your IP. You have several tools around here We can help you, okay, display exactly the digit of your, of your IP resource, okay? So another question for you, after what we did so far, what is at the top of the DNS tree? Let me check if all of you understood what we just Talk about we were just talking about what is at the top of the DNS tree. Okay, again we go on menti.com, same code. Or if you are already on the page, just stay on the page. Okay, we already have 100 players. Okay, where are the others? It will be very fast. So just open the window on menti.com and we'll use the code. Okay, good, let's start. For 
sorry. So we just uh, okay. What is at the top of the DNS tree? You have 15 seconds to give your answer. What is at the top of the DNS tree? Okay, four more seconds. Yes, we have the dot at the top. Mm, some people did not follow us. <laughs> Okay, but most of you uh, have the right answer. Good. Next question. Okay, we see do, who are following us. This is good. Second question for you. Again, you have 15 seconds. One possible reverse zone for this IPv4 number one possible reverse zone for 196, 192, 140, 254. You have three options. Okay, I see now we have less people who find the right answer, only 39 of you. Okay, last question in this series. One possible reverse zone now for this IPv6. You have again three options. Remember that for the reverse zone, we always start with the dot, then the top level domain will be ARPA. Good. 43 people find the right answer. Okay, I can say that um, we were following what we did so far. I think we can move on to the next, next section of our webinar. Okay, so now the three major component of the DNS. Let's move to the right question. The DNS servers. Okay, first of all, before we move on, you have to understand that regarding the DNS function, an authoritative server is not a resolver, okay? Because sometimes people use to confuse the two function when they are implementing uh, any kind of um, DNS software. So remember that an authoritative server is not a resolver, okay? Yeah, and maybe a way of, of remembering that is that authoritative is the server that knows and knows his answers and, and he answers on behalf, you know, for his own. And the resolver is like the sort of the, the client part is, is the one who's going to get the answer, right? They're, they're both servers in a way, but the two roles, they're very, they're, they're very distinct. They're very, very different. Yes very distant and we'll also just talk about it uh, later on so now take a, um, what is the authoritative name servers so they publish the mappings for domains under the authoritative control this is why you have the soa so typically an organization will implement authoritative service to respond to address queries for all the subdomains and they are capable of providing a definitive answer and we advise you at that stage to have at least two servers who should be which should be authoritative for your zone which means that they have them they can give the right answer they have the what we call the source of trust for your zone okay that's basically the purpose of authoritative name server So now move on to the resolvers. So for the resolvers, we can, you can consider them as the client side of your DNS. So it's responsible of initiating and sequencing queries that will lead to a full domain resolution. So now you can have several kinds of resolvers. Some can be recursive. You have those who are non-recursive, iterative. So it depends on the, res the resolution process they use. 
But the last point is the most important is to understand that they have to reduce the network delay and also the name server load. Remember that you have uh, several name servers uh, on the internet and they are providing uh, answer to the zone, okay? When we say, for instance, afrinic.net, I guess you know that we have um, several name server who can give you replies for afrinic.net, but at the same time, the resolver helps you to, to have that response in your cache such a way that you not have to query every time the authoritative server for a specific zone. Okay, just a um, brief overview of some DNS programs that you can have here and the function. Remember that we are, talk we are saying that the authoritative function, it's not the same as the resolver. So you have several um, program like Unbound, which is only a resolver, okay? Resolver only, you have not, which is only an authoritative server. You have the not resolver, like the name is saying, it's just a resolver. Many people know bind, okay? And many people know that bind can do, can do the, the two functions, authoritative one and resolver one. You also have power DNS, for instance, one for the server and one for the resolver. But the most important, like we just told you at the beginning of this section, remember that the authenticity function is not the same as the resolver. Okay, now we just discussed about, okay, what can you have in the domain name space? Now let's see how everything can be used. Now Willie, talk before, before we yeah. go into this, there was a, a little question that maybe we can um, answer quickly yes. um, from Bai Gaspar. He's asking what protection mechanism did you implement for, for zone walking? And I know that he was asking this when we talked about the zones. So the idea is that um, in the end, the zone file, it, it acts like a, like, um, like a database and the DNS, it is meant to be a, a public database. Um, as a domain administrator, you have to choose which parts you want to make public and which uh, you don't want to. And, and this is generally um, up to uh, the security policy of that particular organization, uh, whether you're a company or you're a university or you're a government uh, agency. So uh, if, if you want to prevent the public to uh, to from walking the zone. Walking the zone basically means to discover which are the domains that are in that uh, forward zone file, forward or any zone file. Well, the safest thing to do would be to put it in, in a server. Uh, is not to put it in a server that can be um, queried by the public. Right. So mm -hmm. there's different ways of doing mm -hmm. uh, this depending on the software. Uh, you use. So we saw a list of softwares. Uh, so you need to go to the manuals. You need to see how do I, how do I prevent uh, or I make um, the zone files uh, uh, not queryable. Um, yes. if, if, if you want specifics about that, you know, we can maybe take it uh, later on. Or mm -hmm. uh, what I suggest is that you, you know, you, you, you read further on, on, on the topic. It is a very well-known topic. It's a, it's a very well-known um, sort of a side issue. Um, so this is something that you can read about. Yes, uh, you're right. I uh, also want to add uh, to that one that yes, uh, like just some people just say Roland, for instance, say there are several mechanisms around that. Uh, and also um, we, when we'll talk about the DNSSEC regarding specifically the zone working, there is also a way to prevent so, 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 so things like that one. I think there is also another question here. I see uh, Mohan Pradhan was asking if authoritative DNS is down, how does uh, the resolver respond? I think we also, once we uh, present the mechanism of the resolution, then we'll be able to explain to Mohan. Yeah. Okay. So just wait a little bit. So now the mechanism of the resolution. 
like you can see here in the picture, it's, um, it always starts by a query that you as user send to, it can be you as a user, think about any device, any, just a request that you send to your local resolver. It could be your email client, for instance, when he's trying to connect to the email server to get the messages. Um, it can be your browser. So mm -hmm. you, don't need, you, don't, you don't need to initiate it. Uh, in fact, there's many, many, many connections which are not initiated uh, by you as a person. Exactly. Then if the resolver has it in its cache, it can respond directly, okay? Because that's the purpose of, that's one of his purpose. Otherwise, he sent a recursive or, or non-recursive request to a root server. This is step two, okay? In that example, we are trying to give the answer of that one, okay? We want to reach 3w.afrini.net. So he sent a query to the request to a root server, in that case, the nearest root server, then after the nearest root server has been reached, he also sent, because the nearest root server will give him the address of the net.net name server. This is step where you see step three. And then our recursive server will ask the request to one.net server step four, then the .NET server will give the answer to our cache saying that, okay, if you want to know where you can have answer for afrinic.net, okay, we are at step five. Now send the request to this specific server, step six. Then step six, which is one Afrinic name server can say, okay, oh, you want to know where is our web server, okay? The, our web server is at this IP before address, for instance, step seven. Now our resolver store the answer in his cache and give the answer to the user host. This is where you have step eight. So anytime your user host will ask, will query, query again the same name, or at least the same domain name, the, the resolver will be able to give you the answer. So, so it's, this is basically the mechanism of the resolution. Before we move on, I want to ask, or I want to just kind of shed a little bit of light because um, and, and maybe an, an, a very quick conversation with you, Willie. Mm -hmm. Why does this process seem to be um, long and complicated? Why don't we ask somebody directly and, you know, that somebody tell us everything, right? Why do we need to query the root server and then the root server replies and gives us some, some part of an answer and then we need to get that answer and then go to somebody else and then is, is there a reason why? And the reason why I'm gonna answer myself is mm -hmm. uh, the DNS is built to be a distributed system. And what you want in a distributed system is to have entities which are responsible for certain parts so that if, uh, uh, if, if that particular entity um, has an outage or has a problem, um, the whole system, uh, you know, the, the, the system, let's say, is resilient or robust. Um, the root servers will only know about the, um, the first, the top level domains. So they will only be able to tell you, okay, well, uh, I don't know the whole address of uh, dot, 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 afrinic.net, but I know who .net is. So the, 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 he only, that server only knows uh, those top level domains. And that allows uh, for the DNS to grow, to scale, and um, it allows for different organizations to 
be administrative responsible for different um, zones. Um, mm. And that's a way in which organically the DNS has been able to scale for over 25 years. And we will see that this is one um, way of being resilient in, exactly. in, in a way. So that's the reason why um, we're doing three steps. We're doing three steps because we're asking different people that have different responsibilities that are authoritative for different zones. And this is a, something we do in purpose. So in, while it might look that we are kind of slower or that we're not very efficient, we're actually building a system that is much more um, um, efficient for, um, for failure um, and, uh, and that we can scale much better because we can put as many servers as we need close to the users. And that, that's where we will talk a little bit later about any cast. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Also, I think we can also um, uh, answer to Moan's question. I uh, recall the question was, if authoritative DNS is down, does the reserver respond? Mm -hmm. I think you can see here, Mohan, uh, when, you op when you have this, this diagram, for instance, let's say that we have .NET server, at least one name server is down, okay? And consider that maybe we have the answer already in the cache of our resolvers. Then even if this name server is down, I'm just saying, let's consider that all the name servers were down, okay? at least you can have the answer because you already have the answer in your cache. This is just an example, okay? But what you have to understand here is because the DNS is distributed and because you see all the functions are not only uh, in, one so in one server in one place, then you can have a chance to have an answer but we will have more details later on. Okay, so now you see that we are talking about the, the queries, but you have the way to okay, authenticate the queries. This is what you, why you have the DNSSEC, okay? Basically the DNSSEC is here to authenticate what you have, the, it's a kind of um, provide origin authentication and integrity assurance service for your DNS data, including the mechanism for to authenticate the data and even the denial of service of existence of DNS data. So all answer from your DNS, DNS protected zone are digitally signed and the DNS resolver can check if the information has been modified. And the last section um, regarding you have several records, um, resource records that you have when we talk about the DNS set. Uh, DNS key, DS, NSEC. Just want to say that for the NSEC, for instance, uh, we had a question at the beginning where uh, someone was talking about the zone working. Okay, let's say that NSEC, especially NSEC tree can help you solve some issue regarding the zone working. So just a short comment about that one. Now let's move to the operational consideration. So we just give you some recommendations regarding how you can operate your servers. And this is, I think, one of the most important things you have to know. The guiding principle is redundancy and diversity. Never put all your eggs in the same basket, okay? If you can just remember that sentence, I think, that will be the most important for this webinar. Never put all your eggs in the same basket. And we'll see that for each layer of the operational consideration we'll be talking about. So let's start by the physical network and application. Before we move on, another question for you. How do you create the relationship with your parent zone? How do you create the relationship with your parent zone? You go on Menti, 
50 seconds. How do you create the relationship with your parents? Five seconds. Okay. Okay, that's eight people find the right answer. I see that we have good uh, people who know a uh, little bit about the DNS. Okay. So physical and network layers. First layers that you have to consider. Do you want physical or virtual servers? We can say that uh, if you manage yourself, yourself the zone, we recommend you to have at least one physical server. Why? Because you can use it uh, for DNS sake. Okay. This is the case where you have to manage yourself, your zone or several zones. Talking about the physical location. Yes, you can have uh, one in your infrastructure and one in another, let's say a uh, location. Uh, it can be uh, another region, another country, another continent or even for the first, in the first case, you can have one server in your network and another one maybe uh, in another place. Uh, talking about the number of servers, the minimum will be always two. For the RAM, I think uh, nowadays the RAM is something which is cheap, but depending on the kind of zone that you serve, you have to consider that it should be, the RAM should be at least three times or maybe four more the size of your zone file in plain text. Now, something which is very important is the network redundancy that we recommend you to have different carrier transit IP for route diversity. And autonomous system on that point, uh, the most important is to make your zone available from two distinct autonomous systems. Remember, we tell you that don't put all your eggs in the same basket. So you have this principle for all these criteria. Regarding the application, application layer, uh, we, the first thing will be to avoid running the authoritative function and the resolver on the same servers. And talking about the network or the authoritative servers, we already said that you can have once a first setup can be, you have two authoritative servers on setup number two, you have one which is hidden and you have two other authoritative servers. So it basically it means you can have three servers and one which is hidden. And considering the firewall rules, uh, I know many people just allow port 53 over UDP, but not only port 53, please guys, also port 53 over TCP uh yes it's very important and you also have if you use dns over tls you also have to allow for 853 last country last consideration regarding the application layer sign your zone with dnsec if the parent zone is is already using dnsec then you can gain um, more benefits also if you use dnsec in your zone and you have to use uh, DNS programs which are compliant with RFC 7766, which is basically around the persistency of your connection and the pipelining of DNS request. The last recommendation here I would say is for you to run diverse di DNS programs across your network, especially, especially if, you, um, if you cover a lot of, let's say zones, customers and if you have a um, big area, area into brackets, okay? As much as possible, try to run diverse DNS program. It can be diverse in terms of version, can be di diverse in terms of software, but again, we, we are talking about the resiliency. So do not put all your eggs in the same basket. Always keep that sentence in your mind. I think it's it's important for people to remember um, that you know all, all software uh, come with with with, with bugs. Um, 
uh, also will come with vulnerabilities and by 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 using different um, software what you're doing actually is spreading the risk of um, having uh, I don't know a critical uh, uh, vulnerability or a bug um, that affects all your author authoritative servers for instance so if you run bind and you run NSD or um, you run uh, unbound uh, and, and bind, you, what you're doing is actually spreading that risk, correct? So um, it, it, it's, something, it, it's something that uh, my, on the short term, it is an annoyance, right? Because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you not only need to know about bind, but you might need to know about a second uh, software package. But on the long term, this is the real value of making your DNS uh, infrastructure resilient, which is having this diversity. So, so maybe this tutorial, this webinar should be called, you know, how, how you are, you know, do you are now yourself? Because you, you need to learn, you know, how to become more resilient. But in the end, this is the main, this is the main issue. It's, um, it's, it's not only making sure that things work um, uh, on the sort of the best case scenario, but think of how, th how um, you can have um, risk or threats and how you can mitigate those. And um, the application layer is, is, is the one that we're covering now. But if you go back into the network layer and the physical layer, uh, again, that will require you as a DNS administrator to talk to the, the network engineers of your organization and, um, and, and figure out, okay, um, how do we get connectivity out? Um, are we using a, a single link over the same fiber that goes all the way to the service provider? Can we have two? Can we use two different providers? Um, uh, can we make the, can we run the name servers in different uh, um, subdomain, sorry, in, in different subnets? And can those different subnets be announced via different autonomous systems? So if there's an outage or one autonomous system loses visibility on the global internet maybe the other one continues so um i think it's it's um it's a very good exercise for a team of people a dns administrator uh, a network engineer and a security um, engineer to sit around the table um, look at the potential um the, the risk factors and trying to mitigate them. And of course, you know, there is, and, and, and of course you're gonna have to, um, how do you say, you, you, have to, you have to manage these within your own constraints of your budgets and your resources, etc. But it is good to have a plan and it is good to, to know, um, to, to know your, your, your vulnerabilities somehow of your infrastructure so that you can improve over time. Yes, that was my you. comment. Yeah. And Gael and Willie, I, I just want to interject here because in the uh, question and answer uh, box there, we're, we're getting s some feedback and, and uh, Ronald Dobbins is, uh, has expressed you know, some disagreement with your uh, comments. So just want to uh, direct you over there and, and um, you know, to, to his comments and, and maybe get you to react Yes. Um, to, to to what he he was asking and, and wait, okay, yeah, I, I'm I'm just seeing them now. Um, but I can what? I can give um, uh, just a clarification if you mind if you if I can. Yes, go on. I but I think we I think we agree. I don't. Uh, why not recommend? Yes, exactly. um, yeah, yes I, uh, okay for Roland and Scott. Okay, uh, we can make just a short clarification when we are talking about diversity here. Uh, yes, uh, we agree with you. 
It should be not only diversity in terms of software, DNS software, but also diversity in terms yes. of operating system. So basically the idea is the same, which is just don't use only one product or one software, okay? So you can have one software, the same software running in one specific operating system and the same software running in another operating system. But yes, we, you get the point here. I want to answer also to another question or uh, we can discuss about that one. Uh, so someone were asking, why, the, why do we need a hidden hot serve, auto, authoritative server? In, remember in the setup, we're just saying that one, posi one uh, setup that you can have is to have, first setup have two authoritative servers and the second setup will have one hidden server and two authoritative servers. That can be one setup. So for that one, we can say that, okay, you need uh, also see that um, we also have one comment in the, the chat regarding that setup. But basically that setup is helps you increase at the same time the security and also helps you remember that you have to, does your zone file, you keep the zone file in a safe place as much as possible, okay? So you can manage your zone file from one server which is not known from, let's say the public or at least outside the network. And anytime you have an issue with your public server, you can always, um, you can always uh, have the original copy, the source of trap from your hidden server. And you also have this kind of setup because it can help you regarding DNSSEC. Now you can have this server, it doesn't need to be online anytime. So your server can be on, out um, offline and you can use that server only when you want to sign your zone or when you want to generate a new case for a new keys, for instance. So basically this is why we can need a hidden server. Again, it helps you, helps you to increase the security and at the same time, the resilience. Okay, any other question before we move on? Um, I, I think, uh, Roland, I think you have, a, you have a very fair point. Um, uh, uh, about the risks um, associated um, in, in running different code bases. Um, and I think there's a risk associated in running two code bases. And there's also a risk of running just one that has vulnerabilities or that is not correctly maintained. And, and those are the two elements that you should, um, you should you should evaluate uh, when taking a, a, a decision. So th those are those are the, the the two sides of the argument. Um, so I'm, I'm I apologize if it didn't look like you know we we're putting you know the 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 two um, um, the two sides of, of the, the the argument. But that's um, um, the, 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 there's always yeah there's always a, a, a risk involved. Yes. In addition, we can say that okay. You can do what you are good at, and also uh, you work with other people that are good in what they are used to do, okay? So it depends on, because for the DNS, it's okay. How, what do I want to do? Do I want to manage everything myself or do I want to manage to give to any, let's say external parties, the management of a specific aspect of the DNS? So it's up to you. So you just, the most important for you is, okay, at least to have the big picture, know exactly what is involved regarding the DNS. And now you can see, okay, maybe you can do everything at your side or you need to uh, work with any external parties. So it's up to you at that point. And uh, regarding the, uh, the software, I um, just want to mention that, uh, for instance, here in Afrinic, uh, we use a diversity of at the same time, hardware and software. Uh, we use FreeBSD and Linux as the operating system, but for the software, we use uh, NSD and Bind. 
So we try to mix, uh, to have this kind of diversity within our own infrastructure. I guess in, at PCH you have something like that, right, Gael? Yes, um, we, yes, I think we're running bind and NSD and the underlying operating systems. We're running CentOS and um, I, I'll have to, I'll have to talk to, uh, to my knock uh, to double check. Yes, but it's okay. But at least, yeah, uh, yeah, there's, there, yeah, those, those considerations are, yeah, they're, they're part of, um, yeah, they're part of the, the, the decisions that, that mm -hmm. we take. Yeah. Okay, we have another question uh, from Mohan. Uh, he was asking, can DNS host in virtual machine or to have, uh, to have standalone server? I think you mean, can we use a virtual machine for the DNS or do we need a um, physical server? For, based on my experience, I can say that it depends. Um, if your load is not very important, you can have a virtual machine. Um, and again, we say that the physical one, especially if you want to sign your zone, and if you want to use an hardware security module, um, what we call a HSM, okay? Now it will be better for you to have a physical one. But if you do not have a very huge load and even the virtual server can be okay. At least for your one of your second, second name servers, okay? At least. Yes, but it's possible. Okay, I think we can move on. Okay, let's move on. Now we want to talk about the maintenance of your zone. Just some consideration here at that point. So just a quick reminder or a refresh. Here, for the maintenance of your zone, you have to take into consideration what you have in the field names. We have the serial, the refresh, the retry, expire, and the negative cache TTL. So the last one is mostly for your resolvers, okay? So the serial, you always have to increment that one. So there are several mechanisms to increment the serial number, but always increment the serial number. Now the three others, again, which are the refresh, retry, and expire basically helps the other name servers or the other servers on the internet to know exactly at which frequency they should come and ask for any update of your zone, okay? For the refresh one, it helps the secondary name server to know, okay, when shall it come back, okay? Anytime you, you want to know exactly, okay, when my name server should come back to see if there is an update of your zone, this is where the refresh comes in. Now, if you have an issue, let's say that I cannot contact the primary server of the zone. Now we have the retry. The retry tells you, okay, if you cannot complete the query, after how many time shall we, you come back? So if you are not able to query the name servers, if you have maybe a network issue, you cannot contact it. So you have a time that you can use to know exactly at which frequency do you have to come back. This is the retry. Now you have the expire. For the expire means that, okay, if it's after several times, you cannot uh, contact the server, then the expire tell you that, okay, you have to discard the copy of your zone. Okay, if it's still unsuccessful up after this period of time, then you have to discard the copy of your zone. And the last one, like I just told you, is for the resolver. The negative cache is mostly, okay, you have the, you know exactly what is, what, what how many times you know that you have the request, the query uh, of your zone, but you also have, when you have a negative response, meaning that the query you were looking for does not exist in the zone. 
So you also have to put in your cash this answer, the answer of something which does not exist in your zone. So the negative cash tell you that, okay, you have to consider that this non-answer should be in my cash for a certain period of time. And it's, it's managed by what we call the negative cash TTL. And now regarding the relationship with your parent zone, okay. Again, always have to provide at least two name servers. And if your parent zone, or no, if you are using IPv4 and IPv6, always provide two kind of glue records, one in IPv4 and another one in IPv6. And for the first level domain, you always have to be consistent with your name servers stored by your registrar. Okay. So just a um, short, um, short overview of two kinds of zone, the header. Uh, the first example here, you have a kind of fast changing zone, basically fast changing because like you see here, um, the refresh is just one hour, meaning that um, the name servers need to query the, the master after one hour. And if there is, if it's in sex full, he has to query again every 10 minutes and you should consider that after one week, the copy of its own is not the right one. This is the case where you have, maybe you used to change, the zone used to change very quickly. So you need to have something like that. And for the low changing zone, meaning that maybe you, let's say you update your zone every, every week or even every month. So you don't need to have very low parameters here. So you can have a setting like the second one where you have the refresh for one day, the retry after four hours, and you consider that the copy of your zone will expire just after one month, okay? But again, the most important is just to know what is the purpose of each parameters here and just adapt according to your context. So we are talking about mostly what you have at the, for the authoritative server. Now move on, let's move on to the resolution site. So for the resolution site, um, regarding the ISP, if we ask you where should you forward your queries, can be either to your own resolver or to an open resolver over peering to a resolver present at your IXP. Guy, we talk about that one later on, or to any mm -hmm. contracted parties. Of course, you can combine all these options, but also um, remember that you have to restrict the usage of your resolver to your customers. As and unless you are also an open resolver, but if it's not the case, you have to restrict the usage of your reservoir only to your customers. By customer, it's your customer and even your own network here. And if you are an enterprise, um, most of the principle applies here, but for your enterprise, it's definitely, you definitely need to restrict the usage to your internal network anytime. Okay, we move on to the Anycast now. I understand the role of the Anycast. Why do we need the Anycast? Because remember that we are talking about the many operational consideration and we saw that we, you ha can have many issues around that. So now we want to know exactly how can you scale? How can you scale regarding the issue or the operational consideration we were just talking about? And so before Willie, just uh, be, before we get into to this section here in, in, in monitoring in, in the question and answer queue, um, just some of the things that we were just going over. Uh, there are some questions um, you know, 
in terms of if you can elaborate on negative cash TTL, uh, how is rootservers.net not a single point of failure in two possible ways? What is the difference between an authoritative DNS server and a recursive DNS resolver? Okay, so for the negative one, uh, let me just write it here. Negative cache TTL, okay. Um, remember that a negative cache TTL is one parameter that you can have. Just let me go back to uh, one example of the zone file, okay. The negative cache, this one, this parameter here, okay, or here, it will help your resolver know exactly, okay, let's say we have a zone, uh, affinic.net for instance, and someone just typed in his browser, instead of typing www.affinic.net, I will type maybe something like w4.affinic, .net, okay? Uh, and in that case, w4.affinic.net does not exist in the zone. So you have the answer, your reserver will just tell you that, okay, this w4 does not exist and your reserver will keep the answer in its cache that w4 does not exist. So anytime you ask again for this w4, the cache will give you this answer. But remember that your zone can change anytime. So this is why you have the negative cache because the reserver will know that, okay, I have to consider that this W4 does not exist, but after a specific amount of time, let's say in that case, 61 minutes, I'll have to query again the name servers to check if maybe this zone now or this record now exists in the zone. That's basically the purpose of the negative cache TTL. I think there were another question. If you can just remind me that one, please. The, and there are several, it is a very active uh, Q and A box that we have there. Yes, um, yes, I see that. The, uh, what is the difference between an authoritative DNS server and a recursive DNS server? Okay, yes. Oh, so the authoritative- we've, let, let me, Willie, let me take that. We've talked about these. There's two different roles. The authoritative DNS server uh, has the information about its own zone um, and has the definition of what the resources are and the resource records for its own zone while, and that's um, while the DNS resolver is the, the kind of the, the client side of the DNS. So all the, um, the, the DNS requests uh, being generated uh, by the browser or the email client, they go towards the DNS resolver and the DNS resolver can do, uh, can follow the resolution process either uh, recursively by itself going through walking down the DNS tree or um, iteratively. So uh, there's different uh, mechanisms, but they're basically two different roles. They can be combined on the same software package or they can be, um, they can be done differently uh, on different software packages. Yes, you're right. So another question we have here is, okay. Um, why do I avoid running both resolver and authoritative on the same server? So this one from Silas. I think we also uh, talk about that one later on, but um, I will say that first of all, uh, when you manage your own server, uh, especially if you are not very experienced, you can mix the two functions uh, within your server. First of all, you know that there are some, it's not all DNS soft programs 
which implement the two functions. But uh, there are some which implement the two, and sometimes you can mix the two function. And when you allow people to query your server, if you are not careful, you can allow them to, at the same time, query your zone. This is for the authoritative function. And you can allow people from the outside also use your server as a recursor. This is something you want to avoid as much as possible. Because for the recursor side, you want to allow it for only for your, let's say, your customers. And for the authoritative side, if you are managing a public zone, uh, a zone which where um, you need to be, which need to be available over the internet, then this one you want it to be available for the whole internet. So one 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 reply to that one is because you want to avoid this mix-up, especially if you are just a new um, DNS manager. Any other question we can have now? I am answering a few of them. I answered one from Bay who was asking about key rollovers and I was saying that key rollovers are a very specific feature uh, that is required for DNSSEC. Um, and we're not really covering DNSSEC in this uh, tutorial. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't go uh, deep in, into that. I think there's literature, uh, there's RFCs um, and there's plenty where you can read. I, I would point that um, all of a lot of what we're covering here um, can be read on the uh, DNS uh, manuals uh, from the software vendors. So if you go to ISC and you read about Bind, or if you go and you read about NESD or Unbound, I, I think there's there's plenty of very very good resources to increase mm -hmm. your uh, your knowledge about this. Yes. I agree with you. I agree with you. I also want to um, answer the to James' question: um, How will you make a lab which will emulate a root servers, TLD servers, authoritative servers? So everything. So remember, first of all, that um, if you have noticed, on I think on most um, resolvers software that you can have, they have uh, a copy of the root servers or kind of copy of the root server, it can be the hint. So this is how you have at least um, the, the root servers. So this is for the root servers. Now for the other name servers, if you are in the lab, you can even create your own zone file with any zone you want. It's possible if you are in your own lab. Nothing stop you to create any zone file just to test your just to test if everything is working. Remember that the purpose of the authoritative is having your own copy of the zone file. You populate the copy of your zone file like you want, and you can query your own zones, your own authoritative servers. It will work if everything is okay. But again, why why your copy is not available over the internet? Because we always start by the root servers somewhere on the internet. No one will know that, okay, the copy of the zone file you are managing is the one we have to request or we have to query for. So this is why you cannot, uh, usually um, someone will not be able to use the copy of your zone server. Unless you try to uh, be, um, but we'll talk about that one uh, during the second webinar. Uh, when we talk about the security issue around the DNS. Okay. Yeah, I will welcome. I, I welcome some of our um, some of our attendees today to register for the second series on the DNS, which is going to cover is going to cover security and privacy. Um, and a lot, a lot of the questions you have, or you might have, or you might be thinking of, uh, will be probably. Uh, be uh, answered um, in, in a more direct way uh, in this uh, second uh, webinar. Exactly, exactly. So we move on before we continue to answer to some question here. Uh, we already talked about the resolver side and now we want to talk about the Anycast. So what Thank is- Thank you. 
it Willie, was a... um, yes so when we're talking about resilience i think that um, the idea of uh, resilience goes hand in hand with the idea of um, uh, scaling and, and, and grow. And before going into, into detail, um, we have uh, uh, a question and, and I think that I'm, I'm hoping that after the, after the end of the section, uh, you, you will be able to, um, to kind of fully grasp why, you know, um, why we're using Anycast and why we're choosing the Anycast technology for this. Willie, over to you. Okay, so we have a question for you before we move on. Why do we use Anycast technology? Again, we go to Menti. Just let me open the Menti. So the question is, why do we use any cast technology in the DNS? Three options. Why do we use any cast technology in the DNS? So far, 50 people. Okay, three seconds left. Okay. So we have a um, balance of people, uh, balance the load of authoritative, improve resolution time, and some say mitigate against distributed DOS. Gael? Good. Well, congratulations, everyone. I think you are on track uh, for this section. Um, we've been talking so far about um, operating name servers, operating resolvers, but, uh, and we, we've been thinking about an organization, right? Or a, co a corporate or an office or a university, a government agency, uh, you name it. But uh, we have to remember that the, you know, the internet is, um, has spread um, all over the world. And we're talking about a global network. Um, so there's, um, there's people and there's internet users um, everywhere, more or less. There's different geographies and there's, uh, um, there are more people connected in cities than in rural areas. Uh, there might be more people connected and making use of the internet in some parts of, um, of the geography. Uh, but the idea is that we need to find the mechanism to... Um, um, to, to scale um, and grow while being resilient. Um, and um, Anycast is a technology, is, is, um, uh, it, it's a specific uh, configuration and it's a specific um, way of configuring your um, servers so that they can all act together, answering as if they were the same one, right? So, and this is this is a very effective way. Uh, it, it's a proven way. It's been operating and it's been working for almost twenty years. Um, and um, we and uh, so it's been it's been used uh, in in DNS quite effectively. And one of the ways in which you can um, uh, you can publicly uh, kind of um, um, check on this is uh, by looking at the, the root server instances that are across Africa. So while we haven't really mentioned it, um, we've left it implicitly, but you, you might know that there's 13 letters of uh, the root uh, DNS zone. Um, uh, and uh, there's the th these 13 letters have uh, copies um, of, um, of and, and those copies, um, the, the, the root server operators, they use not all of them, but a, a, a large majority will use Anycast as a technology to implement and operate new servers close to, um, close to um, users, uh, close to clusters of users. So um, this is a map, um, a picture of a map taken from the root servers 
um, association website, dot, 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 uh, root servers, uh, dot org. Um, yes. And and you can and, and and it's a kind of an interactive map, and you can browse um, your country. You can go up to the level of a city, um, and you can see how many um, root servers operators are present. And yes. this is good to see because that allows you to understand a bit more where we were talking about the process of the resolution, you know now that at some point you're gonna to talk to a root server. So one of the things that you wanna want is if you want a resilient um, DNS uh, infrastructure is uh, you want to understand how far you need to go, or how far you need to query uh, a root server and see if it's within your country boundary or or, or not. So this is one way of looking into the, the reality in the continent. Um, um, we can move on into the next uh, uh, slide. Um, I think uh, this is, maybe Willie, you can probably touch up upon this. Yes, um, so this is just, um, just want to say that uh, here at Afrinic, we have um, any cast located at several places around Africa, like you see, and not only in Africa, we have Madagascar, Poland, Rwanda, South Africa in three places, Tanzania and Tunisia. So Guy, it's up to you. Okay, so when I was talking about NECAS 4DNS, the reason why we're saying 4DNS is that NECAS can be used um, or is used by uh, generally um, uh, any network that is serving content, right? So uh, we, we can treat here in this webinar DNS as one type of content. And uh, the idea is that uh, this was first proposed, the idea of um, using any cast um, uh, for authoritative uh, root and TLDs comes, goes back to 1995, uh, 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 where, you know, two people, Bill Woodcock, who was work, was at PCH at the time, and his uh, the current director and Mark Costas. Then he was a very sign. Uh, first proposed this um, idea. Um, uh, PCH um, started um, operating production anycast for CCTLDs and reverse zones in 1997, and in 2002 we first hosted uh, an anycast production or root name. Um, server. So for the ones who are, who are not familiar with uh, PCH, we are a non-profit that um, operates neutral infrastructure um, um, that is um, using Anycast technology um, and we are present and we're um, globally uh, distributed um, using these Anycast um, technology. So we'll go a little bit more deeper into, into that. Um, there are several root server operators like the University of Maryland, NASA Research Center, and ISC that they also use any kind of technology. Um, I have to go into detail to see, but some of the, some of the root server operators uh, are only operate in unicast. So they only have one uh, one instance, but most of the other ones, they, they really do um, any cast. So we will go to the next um, slide. Uh, so what is exactly, what's, what's the magic? What's exactly this idea of uh, any cast technology? So what you would do is you have a distributed cluster of um, identical instances of a server. Um, and, and the idea is that they all have identical data and they have more or less the same, um, um, in a way, the same um, um, RAM and um, the same hardware dimensioning so that they can service all the requests um, identically. Um, each instance uh, will have a regular um, globally routable IP address for management purposes so that you can um, you know, you can, you can ping, you can SSH to that particular instance, uh, but, and this is where the magic comes, each instance also shares an IP address in common with all the others. And this is where we start seeing um, um, the, the, the sort of the, the, the re resilience. By using the same IP address, uh, what you're doing is that you're able to spread 
and have multiple instances and uh, uh, grow and scale up uh, organically as you need, okay? Uh, who is going to decide which instance are you going to be talking to? Well, um, it's the uh, global routing system, is BGP. Probably you have heard of BGP, it's called it's the Border Gateway Protocol. It's the language that routers speak to each other. So um, when we decide where, uh, where we decide the path that our packets take, um, BGP is going to be directing our requests to the closest um, Anycast instance. Um, and and, um, and the, the clo when we say closest, we, we should qualify the closest. The, we, we're saying closest in topological um, uh, in, 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 in topological. So uh, we, sometimes that might be different from your closest in geographical terms. So these will be in topological terms. Um, so l l let's move on into a little diagram. We have a little diagram that I think can be helpful to, uh, to understand this a bit more. So in this diagram, you have, um, if you're looking at the left, um, you have a, a, a client and then you have an initial router um, and, and then you have three instances of uh, the same uh, authoritative name server. Um, server one, instance two, and instance three. And um, as you can see, the idea is that, you know, the, the shortest path here will be sort of the, the one on the top. There's only one router. So you can think of it as being very close to you. It might be in the same region. It might be in the in the same data center almost, or it might be in the same country. Uh, maybe the middle path has two routers. So you might think that that's a little bit further away. Okay. And then the third one will have three routers in between. So, you know, longer paths, more delays, uh, more possibilities for eavesdropping or more possibilities for uh, 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 attacks uh, because there's more paths in between, more devices can fail, etc., cetera, et cetera. So, the idea here is that um, a, a, a DNS lookup for uh, names ns.pch.net produces a single answer. So there's one single answer. Um, it's 206.222.31.1. And, um, and that's correct because that's exactly what each of the servers is announcing. So they are announcing that same IP address, and the router will have on its table three potential entries, one with different distances, and the weight will be equivalent to, you know, how far or how close it is. Um, so where, you know, um, we designed the system to be running like this, but if, and, and, and if, you, if, if you go to the next slide, what um, you know what the router believes is that there is only one server system instance, um, and but we've we kind of created a little bit of a trick here. Um, so in this um, setup, um, in this setup, uh, what happens is that you would have uh, you would reach the server through. The, um, uh, the router number two and is the, the, the top path. Um, Im Im imagine, so the idea here is that as you grow or as you want to scale up, you might be able to add new instances in different locations. And those instances will be the ones that will be, be queried by users who are closer or at the proximity of those instances. And I, I don't know if uh, that's, um, and, and that's basically the trick. Um, now, this sounds much, you know, much kind of simpler than um, what it is in a way, because um, you're running different multiple instances in different locations. Uh, you might be using, you, 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 you need to be careful 
um, in the way that, you know, what your transit providers are, because um, there, there is a number of considerations in terms of routing and, and you introduce routing uh, as um, you introduce routing. So, so you have to have a, you know, be very comfortable um, with, um, with routing. But this is basically uh, the idea of, um, of any CAS mm -hmm. technology. Now, if we move on, um, to the uh, next before slide. Before we move on, Gahel, Go on. Uh, Sorry. I'll just say here, um, I have a question for Maurice Poor from, yes, in the Q&A, but I, you already okay. talked about that. Uh, again, uh, he was just asking, won't there be any IP conflict since we are using the same IP address? Yeah, no, there's, there's, no, um, there's no IP um, conflict. Um, mm -hmm. Here, because the, uh, as as I said, um, uh, if, if you look at the slide that is right now, on on um, on this plate, this is something that can happen. Um, um, you have multiple. Pa you, you have, in fact, this is a this is a very good thing because that means that you have a multiplicity of paths to get to the same server. Right. Imagine. I mean, think. Think of you. Uh, you know, at, at at home. If if you only have one path and that path goes down, well, that's not good. Ideally, you would like to have multiple paths to get to the same resource. What we're doing with Anycast is precisely to create that idea that we have multiple paths. What we're doing actually is to have multiple instances. So no, there's no. Uh, just to answer the question, no, there's there's no. Uh, conflict with that okay so if we move on now so i've been talking a little bit about the the, the reasons and and that was on the quiz at the beginning but uh, what you can think of uh, or the way i like to think about any cast is um by adding instances you're basically balancing the load of the dns service um uh, let's try to understand that. So if I have an instance that is very, very, very busy, uh, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an, a hosting provider that has, uh, you know, is running DNS services for the clients um, and it's expanding. Um, it's originally based in, I don't know, in Kenya and it's expanding to the rest of East Africa and, and, and originally has an instance in, um, in, 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 in Nairobi and they keep seeing that there's a huge amount of queries that are being originated in, in Kigali, in Rwanda. At some point, um, there might be a, a economics um, uh, to deploy a, a, an, an instance of the server in Kigali, close to the users um, and 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 you can use a different way, dif different different ways and different technologies to that. But one of them could be using deploying the same, you know, uh, 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 a server with the same um, uh, re requirements, same similar operating system, system uh, size, RAM, etc. And then you can host that in Kigali, um, and and that would balance the load. Suddenly, the um, uh, the name server that was very, very busy in Nairobi because it was answering not only the questions of Nairobi, but also the questions uh, made by users in Kigali or by users uh, in, um, in, in, in Uganda. Uh, now you're only answering the ones that are closer to you. So it is a way of, uh, of, of, of balancing and sharing the load. Um, by doing this as well, what you're doing effectively is that you are decreasing the latency of the service. So for the users in Rwanda and Kigali that had to query the name server in Nairobi, there was um, a, a, a latency, a normal latency, because you know the packets need to, need to go, need to be answered, need to come back. What you do with creating a new instance is suddenly you're shortening and you're re reducing that uh, that latency um, by adding 
instances that are close and by close sometimes we mean local so they're they're local to to your uh, to um to your um to your network or to the users um and the other um the other reason that you might consider um is to mitigate um denial of service attacks um and the idea of this again it's similar to I guess it's, it's similar to balancing the load in a way, because in the end, when you have a, a, a denial of service uh, DOS attack, it, what you have is basically load that is um, load that shouldn't be because it's an attack, but it's load on your servers. So what you're doing is by, by, by having different instances in different locations, instead of, uh, instead of taking down that server because that's the only one, depending from the location where the instances, where the attacks are coming. And, and you know that sometimes when we're talking about this DOS, uh, we might be using uh, botnets, which are sort of, you know, um, uh, infected uh, machines that might be anywhere in the world and that they launch attacks. So if we have uh, a, a Nanicast, um, uh, network or if we, if we introduce any cast in, in the network and we have several instances that's a way of protecting us and mitigating those those attacks um okay we go we can go to the next um yeah so um i was mentioning before that uh, pch operates uh no train infrastructure um where we host um, um Root um, root name servers. Uh, we host about 115 um, top level domains for country codes. So, uh, um, and we will host another like another 200 or 300 top level domains. Um, we host that in in neutral infrastructure. And the way in which we uh, participate and we generally enter. Uh, countries by we work very closely with the IXP operator and we try uh, what we do is we we, we deploy uh, hardware um, um, very close to the IXP uh, switch uh, we connect to the IXP and we share and we, we announce the services via pairing so, um, so the idea is that whenever there's an uh, exchange point um, in your country, there's a great chance that PCH is present and can resolve um, um, some of the DNS queries. So, re remember where we were going. Remember where we were going through the process um, earlier on, and we were going to the root. TLDs, uh, well, uh, in some of these cases, you might be hitting, um, you know, PCH um, authoritative um, name servers. Um, the idea of adding uh, this slide here is that you can see the value of having um, um, of having uh, name servers uh, connected uh, to the exchange point and being very very close. Uh, very close to you, both in sort of physical terms, but also in, in sort of performance and latency terms. So most of these, uh, you know, via peering sessions, uh, most of these connections will be like one gig or 10 gig connections and will have a very, very low latency. Um, um, I don't know, less than five milliseconds. Uh, and, and, and it's very, you know, that is the basis to uh, improve the performance uh, for and the end user experience. Um, um, if you click on the next, and then I think the next is just a small diagram about you know not only we not only we run authoritative name servers, but we also um, we also run a, a, um, a network of uh, route collectors, um, and we archive. Um, we we basically. Um, listen to the BGP messages exchanged between all the BGP peers 
and we archive those and we provide them to the research and to the operational community so they can, um, they can run research um, um, on, on, on what happens in, in an exchange point. And uh, that is also very helpful for troubleshooting. Um, the wrap collector can be configured as well as a looking glass, which we have. And um, anyone can go and see, okay, are my prefixes being announced properly? Um, um, are, is this network announcing me what, what they're supposed to be announcing me? Uh, or, or is this service, for instance, PCH also operate? Um, we provide infrastructure to Quad 9, uh, 9.9.9.9, .9 .9 .9, which is a public resolver. So we've talked about now, now you should be comfortable with the idea of understanding what a resolver is. So it's a, sort of the client side, right? So if you're querying to uh, Quad 9 to 9.9.9, .9 that is also uh, within our um, PCH infrastructure. Um, so that is, okay, that's it for this slide. Um, yeah, yeah, we're going back okay, into so, the uh, DNS project. Exactly. Uh, so I uh, just uh, have a um, short presentation of what we do at Afrinic uh, in terms of DNS project. You have one on the DNSSEC. And you have um, several activities uh, um, in the DNS support program. Uh, we're just talking about the Anycast and also we have the project around the road server copy. I just want to answer one question in the chat uh, from, I think it was uh, someone who were asking what are the criteria to be selected as uh, for one Anycast location regarding Afrinic. So the most important is to be um, a CCTLD and CCTLD and if you manage yourself, let's say, of, of course, your, your, your zone. And if you have a second level zone, then you can be a location for an Afrinic Anycast. So that's it. I think I can also go back to some other questions, yes, like you see here in the map, this is for the countries involved in the Afrinic secondary domain program. Um, just a clarification, this is only for the first level domain, let's say .cm, uh, for instance, not the second level domain. Um, okay, this is what we have. And we just give you uh, some reference you have here you will have the material at the end. So don't worry about that. You will have everything. And also just want to give you the link of our help desk. If you have any request, if you want, if you want us to help you um, provide you some assistance regarding your either your DNS, DNSSEC, your reverse zone, especially for Afrinic since we are managing your internet resource number then you can fill this form and we'll be happy to assist you and provide you some guidance on that. Yes, if, um, if, um, if, any, if anybody listening to, um, to, this, um, to this webinar is responsible for adding, um, is, is, is on, on, on a position where you know, they want to know more about how um, to use Anycast for their country code top level domains. Uh, please get in touch uh, with, with, with Afrinic um, and both Afrinic and PCH can and help. PCH, for, yes, for of course. Uh, we, 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 are, we are in this together. The idea mm -hmm. is that, you know, we understand that, um, we understand how to make um, the DNS more resilient. And the only thing we need is for you to be willing and to understand the implications. And that's very simple and easier to do. And I think yeah. probably if you've gone through the presentation, you've uh, through the webinar, you know already most of it. So just tr drop drop the Afrinic team uh, a line and we'll be happy to help. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also want to make a clarification. Uh, there were one question uh, from I think Sani uh, about which um, instance they have to choose regarding the root server copies and I think some of you all tried to provide him answer. And I would just want to say that, um, again, it's a matter of, let's say, diversity. And also depends on, okay, what are your 
maybe the interaction you can have with some organization. So during this presentation, you see that, uh, for instance, Affinic and PCH can help you uh, free to provide, to have a copy of some root servers. Do you have uh, many other organizations? What I can just uh, suggest you is as much as possible, you can have many copies if it's possible, but at least you know that, okay, you have these players, you have this organization, which can help you free, and you also have an other organization. So it's up to you to choose any other one you want, but at least you can have many of them. We know that if you recall the map of the root servers, you will notice that the, um, there are some cities where you will have, um, for the instance, several kind of uh, instance of the root servers, meaning that at some point, in some exchange point, they are hosted not only one copy, they are hosted several copies of the root server. So it's always a matter of diversity and resilience. So what next? We just want to, okay, so far we were talking about the operational consideration and just want to tell you that we have another webinar coming soon. And this one will be, um, we'll be talking mostly about the security and the privacy in the DNS. So don't miss the next one. Always stay tuned in our channels. Do we have another question now or are we done? Oh yes, we have a question sent in the YouTube channel was from Marcos and he was, he was asking, is there a minimum or maximum value for the value of the negative cash TTL. And we can, we can tell to Marcos that, um, of course, there will be um, a maximum. Let's say that the maximum will be one day for the negative. The minimum we have to check, but the most important for you is to understand the purpose. So again, the negative cash means that, okay, this query, this record does not exist in the zone. But you know that the zone is, uh, keeps evolving anytime. So you always need to tell to your resolver that maybe at T plus one, this record does not exist, but you need to check again in the zone file because maybe the record will exist uh, later on. So that value should not be too higher. In fact, th that value should be usually very low because uh, if you manage a lot of, if your zone keeps updating a lot, you never want to have something which is very high at that point. So do we have another question before we move on? There is really a very specific question in the uh, in the question and answer queue uh, from Rosario Wate. Okay. Okay, I just, um, okay, I'll, I will read the question first. Okay, uh, thinking the scenario, scenario in which I own um, a block, IPv4 block, and I configure a DNS to be authoritative to various zones as I am an ISP. But one of my clients own that own one uh, subnet in this block configure their own zone. Will there be any problem on the configuration of the reverse zone? I mean, as an ISP, I configure the reverse zone and the sub client want to configure another one. So Roger is uh, facing that problem. So basically what I understand from the question is, okay, you, have, you, man, you are managing one block and you have another customer managing um, a subnet here. So usually what you, the first step is always to, first of all, from your IRR, you have to create the assignment and then you generate the domain object. And if you have a specific domain object uh, attached to a specific customer in IPv4, it will be the smaller block will be the smaller object, uh, reverse object will be a slash 24. So maybe you will, uh, this time, the domain object, you'll create a specific domain object, a slash 24 for this customer only. 
and in the domain object attributes, there will be the, you will then assign the name servers for your customers. But the first thing is from your, from your block, from your domain object, you have to create a specific domain object for your customers. Uh, assuming that your customer, you assign a slash 24, for instance, for your customer, like you just say in your example. So first of all, you create your block, you assign the specific block to your customer, and then in the property of your domain object, you create the specific attribute. In the specific attribute, you insert the name server of your customer. So now you'll be up to your customer to manage just that specific zone. And it's up to you to have the right record in the WHOIS database of your registry, regional internet registry. Okay, so Rogero is asking if it's done in the DNS. What is done in, in the DNS is the management of the zone file, the reverse zone file. But what is done from your IRR is the assignment and the creation of the domain object. So you have two sections, one in your IRR and one another one in your zone file. But the zone file in your case will be managed by your customer. No, in the case of the IP, uh, remember that you are talking about internet resource numbers, okay? In the case of IP, the resource numbers at the top or the resource number are managed by, internet resource number are managed by regional internet registry. So you, let's say that in your case, you need to first start with your IRR where you will be creating this domain object because Remember, recall that, recall the DNS tree. The DNS tree for, for, for reverse zone, you have the dot, you have the APA, and below the APA, if it's for IPv4, you have the in, A, Z, Z, R, APA, okay? And below this, in, in A, D, D, R, APA, then you have, um, your internet resource number managed by your IRR. So it's not like you need to go to a registrar like for a forward zone, it's not the same. You are talking about the, the IP number, the IP number you manage them from your IRR. Okay, I think we are done. One other question that was over in the uh, chat room. Yes. Uh, is there a disadvantage to use a remote DNS from ISP? Okay, I think here um, uh, he, he's talking about the resolver side. Okay. Um, disadvantage, um, in my case, okay, I would say that um, the first first thing you need to know is at least you understand what you are doing, okay? Because uh, if you know exactly why you send your queries to another DNS, another resolver, another um, another resolver, it's okay. The most important is to understand why are you sending the queries? Why do you need I, to do that? I, I, I think that uh, just to sort of finalize, um, there is going to most probably there's going to be a performance uh, penalty mm -hmm. uh, because the resolver might not be uh, local to you. So for this, you'll need to look, um, if you're using uh, Quad9, you'll need to see if Quad9 is present uh, by your exchange point or if your ISP is connected directly to Quad9 or to the other public resolvers, there's a list of, you know, there's, there's probably like about, about 10, a dozen of public resolvers. But um, if, if you're not careful, you will have a performance uh, penalty. Um, the other issue you wanna see and you wanna look at is you wanna look at the small print and you wanna look at what, do, uh, what does the organization do with all your queries? 
So is there a privacy policy that explicitly says that the queries are not used for anything else or um, are they going to be used? Um, are they going to uh, be um, aggregated and sold? So you, you, you have to be careful. So yes, you can, but you need to ensure that the service you're providing to your customers uh, is the right um, is the right service and yeah security and performance you need to look into this yes again uh, don't miss the next webinar uh, we'll be talking deeper uh, on security and privacy and I think we are done so we thank you uh, all of you I want to thank um, all of you for your attendance. Also, all people who help us organize this web, uh, webinar. Um, Jim from USTTI, uh, Gael Nishal from PCH, and my colleagues, uh, Bashir, Stephen, who are helping in the background as well. So thank you, all of you. And again, don't miss the next webinar. We'll be talking about the DNS and the security around the DNS and even the privacy issues. Really, thank you, thank you Gael. Thank you, and, and, and Xiao, and the entire Afrinic and, and PCH team uh, who've been here. It's a wonderful uh, collaboration, and by the number of participants that we had with us throughout the session, uh, something that is highly popular. And we look forward to continuing to work together to deliver these sessions. So, thank you all very, very much for the effort that you put in today and, and over the last several weeks in preparing. So greatly appreciated and, and look forward to many more. Yes, uh, and I just also want to mention that, uh, of course, uh, PCH, we are talking about the um, one resolver. I think you see some uh, features of what Quad9 is able to do, so yes. Uh, it's a kind of reservoir, you know exactly how it's working and what you can do with that one. And you have more details again during the next webinar. Yeah. Okay, so Gael, I think uh, we are done. So see you next time. Yes, see you next time. I see still there's, uh, you know, dif difficult questions by some very knowledgeable people. Um, so we're going to leave it here. Um, thanks very much, everyone, and we, we really hope um, you enjoyed the webinar and you learned something. Um, needless to say that there's much more resources that you can find um, online. I would, I would really encourage you to go to RFCs. RFCs are, the language can be a little bit complicated at the beginning, but they're very, very clear. Together with that, I would say probably the, the, the software manuals are a good place to start when you try to implement something. And you can always email um, Afrinic staff and uh, PCH uh, for help if you are thinking of um, using Anycast to improve the, the resilience of your zone. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Um, again, good evening, the... everyone. Good afternoon, yeah. everyone. Yes. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.